Wanda is the director of the library services for the C.G. O'Kelly Library at Winston-Salem State University. She's a 19... 1977 graduate, and she returned home after nearly three decades of comprehensive library experience. Prior to her appointment, she served as the Associate Dean of Wake Forest's Z. Smith Reynolds Library. She is a leader in this profession. Brown has served as the President of the American Library Association in 2019 to 2020, the President of the North Carolina Library Association, and the President of the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. She is the 2015 recipient of the Demco Black Caucus Award for Excellence in Librarianship. And in 2013, University of North Carolina Greensboro School of Education Outstanding Alumni Achievement Award winner. We are thrilled to have you, Wanda. Thank you so much for kicking off our conference. Okay, thank you. I just want to make sure I don't talk too long. I'll get too excited. So I put my good morning, everyone. I am indeed honored to be with you this morning. And first of all, I want to thank uh, Maury, Maura, for uh, this invitation to be with you today. And I also want to thank you for taking the time to come out and be a part of this session. Um, my session title was Leading from the Heart. And I chose that title because I feel like this past year, uh, people who led from the heart were very visible. And I think as I go through my uh, conversation this morning with you, that you'll see what I'm talking about. So if we look back over um, 2020, and even in now into 2021, it was a year of change, a year of retrospection, and a year of um, a redirection, I'm going to say as well. I think that we um, were all kind of thrown into uh, what I have been calling uh, crisis-driven opportunities. So what did we do? Uh, what did we do and why did we do it, right? So I think if you look at the restaurants who were successful, over this past year, we see that they pivoted. They moved from exclusively serving customers internally to doing uh, curbside pickups. And what a great year for DoorDash. What a great year for Uber Eats. For those companies, they really thrived during this time. A lot of uh, pickup and delivery folks were just essential this past year. I say that they pivoted well. And the reason they did that is because they were leading with the heart. Of course, money was a factor too, but I think that they understood what their missions were. So as we look to libraries, we see that libraries also pivoted. But this is something that I think we do in libraries all the time. I think we always are thinking about our uh, communities and their needs. And as their needs change, we change our services to best meet their needs. So why do you think those companies succeeded? I think they succeeded because they had passionate people who believed in the work that they did and who made a conscious decision to allow their thought patterns to think about how can we do this differently? How can we manage to stay afloat at such a difficult time? And I contend that our profession, the library and information science profession, is full of passionate people. And when we turn those passionate people loose, I think we find that they are quite creative, quite uh, innovative in their thinking if they have, I think, been allowed the opportunity to flourish and think that way all the time. I think that kind of surfaced there too. So I think that well, that is why libraries, I think, were as successful as they were, because we tend to have a lot of people who are always thinking and always thinking outside of the box. But I do think that we learned a lot in this past year. I think a lot of things we will never return to. I don't see public libraries ever totally having only um, 
oh gosh, I lost the word for the story times, virtuals. I think they will they will always have face-to-face -face story times, but I think they will always offer virtual story times. I think that academic libraries will always offer curbside deliveries. What a wonderful thing. We should have been doing it all along. And I think most of us were in some way. It's called interlibrary loan, but it has a different flavor when the faculty member can just pull up at the back door and you drop the package off to them. Or the, the sense of uh, it's not so much about money anymore. We were willing to mail items to students. We were willing to copy, make copies, put it in emails to them, or actually mail books out to students, which is something that I don't think we did on an on the average, we did it for interlibrary loan to other institutions, but not necessarily to our own students. And so that's something that I would like to see continue. I think that um, a lot of libraries were very, very fortunate in that they thought first about their staff. Campuses rallied around the safety and well being of their, of their students, of their faculty, of their staff. But I also think that many staff, I had several who volunteered to come in and make those copies when the campus itself was closed down. Uh, and we, our building was not open, but we would come in and make copies, come in and uh, actually do lots of interlibrary loans, uh, lots of working with faculty to embed things into Canvas. And so as we look back on that year, what would I like to see strengthen? I'd actually like to see the relationship between uh, class, librarian, and instructor strengthen. Because I think that we could embed librarians at the point of whenever the class first begins. And then that librarian is seen as uh, a resource throughout the semester, not just around when the assignment is given that may drive them to the library, but around the whole time that they're there. There are lots of other things I think that will never go back. I don't think that we're gonna rush to take down our plexiglass at the circulation desk. Uh, I don't know that we're necessarily going to remove the six feet social distancing thing. Our campus is committed to returning to normal. Actually, mid-July, we are doing a return to work for those departments that have, most of us in the library have been working, uh, some on campus. I've been on campus every day since early April or May of last year. Uh, so, for those who opted to work from home, we will all be returning because we are hoping to have a fall that's fully face-to-face. -face. So as we think about that, what I would like to encourage people to do is to think about the services that you implemented during the middle of the crisis and how much of that would you like to bring forward. But I would also like for you to take a glimpse at the mindset that you had. What mindset did you put into place? And keep that mindset. So as we talk about 2020, we know that there were several things. Not only was the pandemic one thing, but our communities were, uh, some pulled together, some pulled apart, but there was racial unrest throughout the country. And most libraries found a way to address that because we saw ourselves as the uh, heart of the community. Um, so, but I also think that we took a look inside. So there were lots of schools who wrote statements and their statements would be in support of Black Lives Matters or in support of, you know, some kind of coming together, I'll call it racial harmony. But most of those statements that were written, the ones that I resonated the most with were the ones that had action statements attached to them, right? So their action statement said, because of this, we're going to implement this because I feel that our community needs to have a conversation around this. We will have monthly conversations or we will bring in a speaker 
We will do monthly book coverage, just different things that they did because just issuing a statement to me just said that you, I, I feel you, I understand, but I'm not taking action on it. And so I was very pleased to see that there were some, um, some schools who decided to take action in that point. But I also think that we learned a lot of things if we're looking and we're listening to our students and we're listening to our communities, we learned some other things from this past year as well. I, I ran into this excellent quote <laughs> because it was from Joel uh, Westheimer. He said that the first day that parents were home, you know, working from home and working with their children who were all at home at the same time. The first day they said, teachers really uh, are undervalued. They're underrated because we don't pay them nowhere near enough. He said, the second day they said, oh my God, we need to double teacher salaries. <laughs> and he said, on day three, they said, I must apologize to the teacher. <laughs> for constantly saying that Susie was gifted. <laughs> so I think that we learned that there's a lot of responsibility placed upon that uh, educational environment. But I think we learned some other things as well. We learned that there were those who thrived, who really did well in an online environment, but we also learned that there were some who didn't. So what does that teach us? It teaches us that our learning styles have to be as varied as the students in our classrooms. There are some who genuinely miss that human touch. They miss being able to raise their hand and say, Miss so and so, because some teachers, depending upon how the teacher did the class, did the teacher decide to have it be, you know, a class that wasn't interactive? Did the teacher decide to have it be an interactive class? It, there were very, people pivoted on a dime. I know our, our school was not heavy into online teaching. And so for a lot of teachers, they were like thrown into this. And so it wasn't like they did a, a lot of preparation. Of course, we got better as the year went on because our um, uh, teacher's assistant office here on campus called City really went to work doing education and helping people understand Canvas, helping those teachers who had not used it learn to use it. And so we kind of pivoted. So that's one of the things that I'd like to think that we could continue in. But I would also like for us to really look at um, the differences in our students. So these students that are coming to us this fall really have been home for almost the whole year, most of them. So they have missed a lot as far as that, um, what we know on our campuses is that social, that social gathering, that social connections. I think that this will be a kind of socially starved first uh, year. Uh, for um, for our students. We also learned from last year that the broadband gap is real. And there were lots of students who um, were not able to keep up. There were lots of students who got behind. There are lots of students who are still behind. We are thankful for those uh, hotspots that were available. We're thankful for um, Spectrum and others who decided to give parents access to uh, cable, access to broadband. But then we know that there are places in North Carolina where you live that you still couldn't access, that you still had to drive. Oh my, I was reading a story about um, a faculty member who was teaching from her car with a blanket wrapped around her because she couldn't get consistent um, data access in her home, that she had to drive somewhere beyond her home just because it wasn't physically available, not because she was too poor to buy it or, you know, was challenged with that. It just wasn't available where she lived. And so we realized that there's a lot we have to do to try to bring everybody up to even playing field. And so 
in this past year, I think we've all been a little more retrospective in our thinking. I think we've been a little more um, conscious of our surroundings. We're conscious about the life, I guess, that others have had to endure. So part of uh, my personal introspection was is that I do believe that there's more we can do as an academic library for the community at large, not the community within. So I think we're always thinking about our students and what we need to be for our students. But I think as an institution that sits within a city, we also need to be concerned with the students around us in elementary school and high school, et cetera. And we should look for more opportunities to partner because I think if, if anything else, we have learned this past year that partnerships is essential to our success, to the success of our communities. In Forsyth County, where I live, we are uh, number three in the United States for if a child is born into poverty, that child is likely to die into poverty. I think that we need to take that on as, as a challenge for us. And we should would look for ways that we can impact that, that we can improve that. And so at Winston-Salem State, of course, we have a lot of first year students, uh, first year, I mean, I'm in first generation, I said first year, but first generation. We have a lot of first generation students within the first year program. And so I think that we need to be mindful of that in our programming, in our designs, in our patient and in our passion. So when I hire, I'm looking for people who understand this is where they're coming to work. And this is some of the students who come here could use a lot of hand holding, a lot of molding and shaping, a lot of um, motivational conversations. And I think this is the year for us to really immerse ourselves into that. Because uh, if I'm home and I totally didn't like virtual, I'm not so sure I'm going to go on school if I'm going to go to school and half of my classes are going to be virtual. So we've got to find ways to make these virtual classes represent and be filled with a human touch. Because I do think that this past year has shown us that we want to be, right? We want to be fully engaged. We want to be connected. And I think this class that's coming to us is going to want to be engaged they're going to want to be connected. And I think that we have to design programs around that. So I'm gonna talk about those things. I think that are essential. I think partnering. I think we in libraries have to partner with other departments on our campuses to make sure we're getting the value that we can add to a student's experience thrown out throughout that campus, right? And that comes from partner. But I also think we need to partner with other libraries. One of the things that I found most beneficial during this past year was the university libraries group that we talked about every two weeks. This was so instrumental because uh, it, it helped us come together. What are you doing when you're reopening back in the fall? What are you going to have? How are you going to do it? Are you going to have your study rooms open? Are you going to have them closed? It was just great to have a sounding board. And so you have this within yours. And so I think we need to partner to come together to learn from each other. So I'll say partnerships is extremely important. But I also say that instructional design, we have to get our hands wrapped around effective instructional design, both face-to-face -face and virtually. Because if North Carolina is going to be the state that we're supposed to be, where we're encouraging people to come back, to finish what you started, to get that education that you never had, then we have to recognize that people will be coming in at different levels. And we have to prepare our services so they reach across all levels. So partnerships are extremely important. It's instructional design is extremely important. And then I think that we as, as a library have a responsibility to make sure that we are adding to 
a culturally competent community. And it starts with us by setting an example first. First, our staff need to reflect the community of users that we serve. We need to practice what we preach. We need to be examples for the community around fair and equal treatment, around collections that represent the whole programming that addresses the spectrum of interest within the community. And so I think that if we can if we can learn to master those couple of things, I think that we will be even more successful within our um, our day-to-day -day endeavors. I think we did make a difference. And I think that we, just like teachers, are essential. And that was one of the reasons why I found my way to my office every day, especially during the fall, because I, I, if we're gonna say to a student, it's all right for you to be on campus, then it was all right for me to be on campus as well. Of course, that was my own uh, decision to do that. And I'd stand with what I feel like. So, and many of you may have felt differently and that's fine because what I'm learning more and more is that the world's full of different uh, thoughts and different opinions. And that's why we're different. And that's why we make a great team because we're not all the same and we don't all think alike. And it takes some of all of us. It takes you thinking the way you think for me to be mindful. And I think when we bring mindfulness to work every day, I think that we will um, accomplish a lot more and we will make people happier in their current positions and happy people think. I mean, happy people think outside the box and happy people contribute. And that's what we're looking to do. So let's see, one of the uh, last things as I look to, to, to wrap up, one of the last things that I had the pleasure of doing uh, while I was ALA president, I had the pleasure of meeting people a lot of different places, right? And after I would finish speaking, people would always come up to me and say, you know, I don't have a library degree, but I was asked to manage the library in my town. So we were like in Maine, South Dakota. And this was really an eye-opening uh, kind of experience for me because I really hadn't been exposed to that many people leading libraries that didn't have library degrees. But I, I contend that that's a, an avenue where partnerships would definitely help as well. But I also said to ALA, that's a door for you. It's a door to, to maybe take make training more affordable, to make training more virtual, conference attendance. How could I ever expect to attend an ALA if it's only two people in my library and want to shut it down to go to a conference? Probably not. So one of the things from the pandemic that surfaced was virtual conferencing. I think that virtual conferencing will enable more of what we're having today. So it'll be face-to-face. -face. I also think that we missed a lot not having face-to-face. -face. Oh, we brought on new members of the ALA executive board. And for some of them, it was just obvious that face-to-face -face gives you a different um, kind of level of appreciation for differences of kind of greater understanding. And I know that the more we understand the people we work with, the more we understand how, what lens of life they look through at everything. I think the greater the, the greater the um, conversations can be, but also the greater the collaborations can be. So I um, came away with that though, thinking that, boy, a library sure does attract a lot of passionate people. And I think that's great. So now what I challenge people to do is to take that passion, think outside the box. How can we put that passion to use within our communities? So that's where I came up with this leading from the heart. Because I think if we're open, we're realizing what our communities need. I think we see it. I think we sense it. I think you feel it because I think you're immersed in it. I, I always tell people that if you visit a doctor, if you have a nurse, if you have a teacher, if you have a police officer, the more those people feel for the communities they serve, the more responsive they are to their needs, the more likely they are to be understanding of differences in people because they really are immersed within that community. 
Uh, so one of the final things I thought I'd do, I had the pleasure um, you know, a couple of weeks ago to serve on a committee that was voting for the Library of the Year. So I had the opportunity to read maybe four nominations. This was public library, not academic, but it really got me to thinking about if I had to write a nomination for my library, what would it include or what would it look like? So I was asking Maury if maybe I'm going to say some things and I would like for you to type your responses in the chat because I, or, or I don't know, I, I guess you can't come and talk. I'm not sure how your webinar is set up. But uh, so the first criteria was service to the community. So if you think about your library in this past 16 months or so, um, you know, what would you say? What would you say? How would you rate yourself? What would be your bragging point? Do you write in your nomination about how you served your community? What would it be? So let me see if I see anything coming in the chat. I only see three. So that must mean nobody is typing anything. Is that right, Maury? <laughs> If anyone would like to answer live, you're more than welcome to just request access to speak um, and I'm happy to grant it or please use the chat. I think that this is such a fantastic conversation point among all of our libraries. Okay, either way, I'm happy to have them just keep thinking if no one wants to. This is shy group, huh? <laughs> ah, there we go. So what we partner with various entities for COVID testing, wonderful. That's very good. That's very good. Those definitely a link to the community. Anyone else? I thought some, something came up, but I'm not sure what it was. Somebody raised their hand, a couple of people. Delivering materials to students wherever they were. Yes, wonderful. We walked our community with information on COVID. Oh, we loaned out laptops and computer peripherals to students who didn't have them. Wonderful. This is good. Good, good. Good conversation. Good things. So your nomination is taking through. Okay. The second area that we were judging them on was creativity and innovation in developing specific community programs. And those things that you just mentioned would, would fall in that category too. But if you did create some innovation, like, like this, next, um, this next category was creating programs that other libraries would then want to emulate. So they had some interesting things. I mean, I, I was impressed with the libraries who had like, I think three of the four had these projects where community could drive up and pick up a kit and it was like a make and go kit a sew and go kit and then they would sew it or make it and then they'd have a zoom and you could on the zoom show <laughs> your uh show the thing that you had made and how you made it and what colors you chose so some comments are coming in started tuesday talk series wonderful unique skills interest that's good I think there was one more before that one too. Created a COVID website for the college with advice about working with collections and fun stuff to do, coloring books and puzzles. Very good. This is good. What I, what I want us to do is to, to figure out a way that we can share our stories too. You know, we need to be sharing them on our campuses and sharing them within our communities. And actually the fourth criteria, the fourth area of criteria was a commitment to equity and inclusion. Demonstrate that the library is working to recruit, retain and promote workers who mirror the communities they serve. So this was actually one of the um, criteria that we were using to judge these. Um, and so did anybody have any kind of ooh, live music? Did anybody have uh, any programs that they implemented during this past time to address, you know, some of the racial climate, some of the um, the discussion around diversity, equity, and inclusion. Did we do anything like that?
I don't see anything coming. Okay, so we know we have work to do. <laughs> we know we have work to do. So just in conclusion, I just want to say that I think passion for the work we do is essential. Somebody created a display of books on diversity. So it's in my life. Laura Davidson. Hello, Laura. So that passion in our work is essential, right? And so I think we look to hire people who are passionate. But then what we do with that passion when we get them on board our teams that makes the difference. So I'd like to just say that's important. And then what's, what is our role in making sure that our libraries have creative mindsets and that they're allowed to flourish and think as our students change, their needs change, the communities around us change, what are we doing to make sure we have that creative mindset? And then what are we doing to make sure that we have culturally competent workforce? What are we doing within that? So how do we embrace things and differences in, in the way we teach and the way we do our instruction? So I hope something I've said today will at least spark an interest and you'll take a minute to think about it. Drop me a note or two if you'd like to have a conversation. Uh, Mari, again, I thank you for the opportunity to share with you this morning. And I hope that something I have said will help your week be brighter <laughs> and that you will uh, reach out to me because I love to, I'm a social junkie too. I want to have people to talk to as well. Thank you so much. Any questions from the floor? Thank you so much, Wanda. This was absolutely fantastic. And we absolutely want to connect with you more and we'll absolutely stay in touch. We would like to open the question and answer period now. Um, you have an expert with plenty of experience here. So we'd love to allow the opportunity to ask her questions. Feel free to use the Q&A box or the chat and I'll moderate some questions to her. The group is quiet. It's what happens when I have a, a conference start at 930 in the morning. <laughs> and they probably aren't through their first cup of coffee yet. But if for the most part, are, are most people still working from home? Wanda, were there any exciting ideas from the library of the year applications? Yeah, I, I think um, uh, there were a lot that won the, the the, where they would drive up and get the kits. I, I just thought that that was because they recognized that there were seniors at home, right? So to me, that the thing that, that resonated with me on that as far as an academic institution was, we were also here for our community being our faculty and our staff, right? right? Everybody, the students had gone home but the faculty and staff, some were still coming in. And so, so what were we doing to enrich their lives? And I'd say we didn't do anything. I mean, we had our library. I mean, they could get something if they called us or emailed us and said they wanted something. But we could have done some other things. I think we could have had book discussions. We could have done, um, like the, the thing with the kit, we were making masks internally in here. I found a couple of sewing machines from the Goodwill and we were sewing masks in the library, but then we didn't reach out. That was an opportunity. We could have reached out to other people on campus to invited them to participate in that, to donate material, to do things. So the greatest, the, the greatest one concept from all the nominees was the concept of community that concept of community being more so than just the students that we serve, but the broader community. I, what services do you offer to students with disabilities? I don't think we have any really services. Well, we allow them to bring their dogs in the library, even though there are a lot of people who are against it, we still do it allow them to bring, you know, the comfort animals. We've tried to make our web pages uh, more, uh, you know, friendly. Uh, so we have a lot of, we had to take down a lot of our videos and tutorials and things, and we had to put them back up so that they were uh, more accessible to people with uh, visual impairments or 
um, hearing impairedness. Wanda, what is the best way to get started on that social awareness initiative for staff? I, I, I would love to know social awareness for staff. I think it starts with a conversation. I, I, I mean, that's what I did. I just kind of said to my staff, you know, I read these nominations and I said, you know, I'm not sure we would have I'm not sure we would have ranked up at the top. So now when people are bringing me ideals, I'm, I'm trying to get them to connect to that. For an example, someone said, oh, I think we need to have workshops for, we have some students who return to school who really don't understand navigating Canvas, which is our learning management system. And so they said, well, we should, and I said, well, maybe we should partner with the public library because the public library is used to teaching people the basics of here's a computer, here's how you turn it on, here's how you turn it off. And so if we embrace them and bring them here, then we're showing that community that this is a, a place for you as well, right? And we don't have a lot of Saturday foot traffic or a lot of Sunday foot traffic. And so if we can embrace our community, that might be a day that they could have here this Saturday. We could have conversations, which, uh, which most of our communities are hungry for and thirsty for a place where they can come and have conversations. Wanda, another question came in. I'm wondering how Winston-Salem libraries navigated the difficult conversations about around race that were happening among library employees in this past year and a half. I'm not sure. I know they did some, um, they needed, a, they had a book talk thing. I think I'm trying to remember what it was called, but they did lead some book discussions around that. The public libraries did. I, I don't think we academics did anything at all. I really don't. I told you when I read that nomination, I, I said, oh, I think we would have failed. But the public library had, I think, some conversations. They did a book read that was one of the topics around uh, um, something, but I can't even remember it because I don't think that they necessarily reached out to us to say, hey, let's do this together because it was a difficult year for everybody. But I do think, um, I think we're all at a point now as we look back retrospectively we can go forward from this and make it better is what I'm thinking. Is there another question? Yes, ma'am. What is the most important initiative you think we should focus on in the fall or as needed initiatives? Well, I, I just think that we have to be very focused on this freshman class. It's, it's, it's just gonna be different. And I'm not sure what that difference is gonna look like. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure. So like if you struggled this past year, we know that there's a lot that they do that I like um, a lot of the testing and stuff they didn't bother to do. So there are gonna be some students who are not as I'm gonna say prepared for school as they may have been had they spent that last, what, gosh, it could be a year and a half for some, because if you were a junior when you went home, you've been home this whole time. Our, a lot of parents opted not to send their students back when they went back. So that digital divide is even greater. And so I think the one thing for me to focus on is that I want to be receptive. I want to be listening to this student to see if the student is coming in with greater needs. I want to see uh, what we were planning for a um, parent orientation tomorrow. And one of the questions we were planning for was, so my student is showing less excitement, less energy uh, towards college and that whole experience because the virtual part of it. There were a lot of freshmen who maybe aren't coming back because, you know, you could easily lose them. See what happens is, and one of the scenario, one of the questions, I mean, one of the answers was, this lady says she actually saw students working in Walmart with their phones out where they were half listening to a class that was going on. 
you know, and so some of those students are going to say, you know what, I just think I won't go back this semester. I'm just going to wait until things get better before I come back. And so you may have students like that that are on the fence. Uh, you might have students who who will need more encouraging. So I'm just saying, be visible, pay attention, be mindful, right? Be mindful, put yourself in their particular situation and try to be as understanding as possible, but, but just be visible. And when I mean visible, I don't just mean looking from afar, but let them know that you're there and, and in that when you create these relationships and the students know you care, I think it surfaces and I think it'll show. And I think it's gonna be needed, that human touch is gonna to be needed a lot more this year. The, the individual who asked the question said that she agrees um, that there is a struggle with how to keep students engaged and prepared. I'm good. Great. Yes. <laughs> okay. Are there any other questions while we have Ms. Wanda Brown available? Wanda, I have a question. Um, as you worked with your consortium of libraries in the triad area um, and worked with them very regularly throughout the pandemic, were there any ideas that sprouted from your gatherings or um, any key functions that maybe grew from that that you all share in? Well, we're working on these same things. We, uh, the triad uh, library, we did actually have our virtual conference and, and the, what we did was try to make it lighthearted and fun because we figured that this group had, you know, not been socializing much with others, but we also kind of had library directors talk about the, the futures to where we see it headed. And then uh, people were eager to share kind of how they read it, their libraries and how we're getting ready for the fall. And so that's primarily what we've been talking about. I, I was saying to my staff, none of the libraries have said that they will go back to 24 five in the fall. I don't know about your schools there, how many of them are open all night or what, but we're pretty much, the agreement amongst the group pretty much was that we would stay open till maybe one or two in the morning until we can kind of get a handle about what the fall is gonna be like. But um, we definitely saw the advantage in having each other to bounce ideals off of. And the group is looking to do some work with diversity uh, and inclusion education around that. Maybe have a, one person on my staff actually suggested having book talks and so we're looking. So just, just by me saying that I'm not sure, where, people automatically started thinking about ways that we could do things that we could embrace the, the broader community, not just the students here, but the broader community. But we also have one of our strategic priorities is to figure out how we can become more embedded in the classes so that we're a part of that class. So they see us as a resource. And so if we're there, then we're seeing, if you're embedded in an online course or embedded in a course that's hybrid, that does some of both, you're seen as the resource there. And students are likely to email you or text you, whatever on the side. And so I think that that's one of our goals for the fall is going to see how we can increase that partnership. Thank you for that. Are there any other questions? We'll give it just a minute for anyone else that would like to add to the chat or to the Q&A. Thank you so much, Wanda. You're this welcome. has been fantastic. And thank um, you again thank you for the invite. all your time. Okay. Thank you. Bye, everyone. <laughs>